Namaskar, welcome to this module on principles of construction management where we are talking of different facets of management of a large construction project and in this lecture we will talk about resource management in construction projects. Before we get into the discussion of this topic, I must share with you that resource management is a full course in itself and we must remember that whatever discussion we are doing in this not only this lecture, but in this module altogether is only a tip of the iceberg as far as the management of construction projects is concerned. There is a lot more to it than what we are talking about here and that will become clear as we go along in this lecture. Let us try to understand that a project can be taken to comprise individual activities each of which has a definite objective to be achieved and that is why we carry out that activity. It has well defined specifications, it has a well defined or a predefined start and end date and it consumes resources. Now as far as construction projects are concerned, what is the kind of resources that are involved? It could be materials, it could be machinery and consumables, it could be manpower and all of this can be converted or in some way or form be looked upon as money. Let us look closely at the various aspects of the resources and their management. So coming to the first part of the discussion, materials management. Now materials constitute a large fraction of the overall project cost and though projects widely differ in their nature, most commonly used materials in the construction industry from a civil engineering perspective could be concrete which could be cement, aggregate, sand or water, it could be steel which is used as reinforcement or structural steel, it could be bitumen which is very important from the point of view of road construction, admixtures, machinery, consumables and so on. The machinery could be cranes, dozers, vibrators, small equipment and all that. Consumables would be oils, lubricants, diesel and what not. Then there could be pipes which could be concrete, PVC, steel and so on and so many other items, woodwork, sanitary fittings, plumbing and all that depending on what kind of a construction project we are talking about. Now having said that, the focus of material management lies in procurement of materials in the right quantity. We obviously need to have a very clear understanding of how much of what material is required of the right quality. There have to be specifications which tell us that okay, we want an RC pipe of this diameter, of this length and these numbers conforming to this standard at the right cost, at the right time. Please also remember that material management involves procurement of these materials at the right time as well. It makes no sense for us to buy all the material that is required in a project up front when the material is going to be used at a later point in time. So we must know as to when a particular material is going to be used in the project and then try to plan for its procurement at the right time from the right sources. Now these issues have to be sorted out for each of the materials that is involved in a construction project and materials are not interchangeable. You cannot say that well, I do not have a 16 mm steel bar, can you use a 22 mm bar? In certain cases yes, it can be done, but that puts a needless effort on the part of the site to these kind of changes if we want to introduce at the site that could cause delays. Now proper material management helps in maintaining an uninterrupted supply of materials to the site and also reduces the storage cost by minimizing the wastage of materials. So we must understand that material management has a cost. The inventory, if we buy a lot of cement for example, which is going to be used later, 
so we have to store the cement in a go down which is going to cost money so it's better to reduce the inventory cost better to reduce the time that your inventory is there with you that's the way you can minimize the cost as well as wastage of the materials so when it comes to material management there is a planning based on availability which is involved there are procurement procedures involved there is inspection and quality control involved at times this quality control and inspection is done at the site where the material is being delivered or at times also at the site where the material or the equipment is being manufactured there will be procedures which will allow an inspection to be carried out at the shop of the fabricator or the manufacturer to make sure that the equipment that is being delivered meets the requirements of quality then there are storage issues involved there is inventory control which is important there is an issue procedure and codification so what we are talking about in this discussion today is material being procured by the client and then being supplied to the contractor or the material being procured by the contractor for the different activities that are involved in the construction of that project and being issued or being used by different agencies at the site so there has to be a process there has to be a procedure so that we know okay how much material was procured when it was procured to whom it was issued where it was consumed when it was consumed whether it was properly inspected when it came in whether the inspection has been completed when it has gone out and so on to make sure that the material has not undergone any degradation while it is in storage apart from that there are transportation issues and computerization has helped in a big way in ensuring a more sophisticated material management system for construction projects so inventory control in material management we are looking at inventory is usable but an idle resource that's a reiteration of what we talked about earlier proper control over the inventory stock helps in maintaining an adequate supply of materials to meet an expected demand pattern for a given financial investment and depending on the criticality and usage frequency of an item the level of control on a given item in the inventory can be decided please remember that not each item which is being procured or used in a construction project is equally critical is equally costly is used to the same extent and so on so as a contractor different levels of control will need to be exercised in its procurement different levels of caution will have to be exercised and that is something which we'll talk about in the subsequent uh, slides identifying the criticality of an item plays a significant role in material management now how do we identify the criticality of an item one of the options available to us is what is called an abc analysis and here what we do is we try to categorize them based on the cost of the item now how is the cost to be decided this helps us in establishing selective control on the number of the orders of the given item based on their category we can classify items as a which account for let's say 70% of the cost b which account for 20% of the cost and c which account for 10% of the cost this will become clear as we go through an example now obviously from this slide it is clear that items which are classified as a need to be watched more carefully than items which are classified as c therefore as far as class a items are concerned they should be managed by the top level management of a company and a closer watch is required and accurate estimates are necessary so we don't want surplus of these items because they are simply too expensive as against that when it comes to items in class b they could be managed by middle level managers and moderate control is required similarly for items in class c we could talk of bulk ordering is preferred to reduce the ordering cost and junior level staff are authorized to make the purchase so this basically outlines a guideline for any company to come up with its own operating procedure or empowering the executives to make purchases of certain items 
Now let us look at an illustrative example of classifying items using the ABC analysis. Now if we have these 8 items A to H with an average annual consumption in numbers given in this chart or this table and the average cost per unit in rupees, how do we classify these items into A, B or C? The first thing we need to do is to find out what is the average annual cost involved in each of these items. So, if we take the average consumption and the unit cost, we get these numbers here. So, if we go beyond that and we rank the items in the order of the total cost from the highest to lowest, if we do that, this item here is the highest and there is this item here which is the lowest. So, if we do that kind of an exercise and rank them here. So, what we have done is that we have ranked these items in this order or this figure here is the total amount of money involved in procurement of all the items. So, if we take this as the base, we find that item C uses 47.75 percent of the total allocation and this percentage varies to the extent that item G comprises only 1.1 percent. So, if we take a cumulative cost here, if we take these numbers, so now we can classify these items as A, B and C. These two become class A because if we total these, this number here crosses 70 at this point, the number here crosses 90 at this point and therefore, these two items that is C and A are classified as class A items. B and D are classified as class B and these are class C items. Now, having done this simple exercise, I would like to leave a few questions for you to think about. A contractor is making a set of houses. Just make a list of things that should be managed from the point of view of materials management. You just have to look around a house and see what are the different items that need to be procured from a contractor's point of view. That must include all the items that you see in the house, not counting furniture perhaps unless you are talking of furnished accommodation, but even if you are looking at bare walls, it should include all items related to electricity, all items related to plumbing, the woodwork and so on. So, once you make that list, you will realize how complicated a job it is or will be to manage the inventory of all those items. Repeat this exercise when you are at a railway platform. The situation will be vastly more complicated perhaps. The kind of items, the scale of the items and so on is quite different. So, with this food for thought, let us move on to the second resource that we talked about that is equipment. Mechanizing the equipment is an important part of modern construction projects. Selection of appropriate equipment in terms of type and size affects the time of completion of the project. The effect on productivity and the total cost incurred are governing factors in selecting an equipment and the importance of timing when an equipment is required and for how long should not be lost sight of. These are the things that we will keep at the back of our mind when we try to talk about equipment selection, equipment procurement and so on. It will become very difficult for example, to make changes in a mechanical equipment once it has been delivered to the construction site or the site where it is going to be installed. The common equipment used during construction vary depending upon the job or the activity which is involved. If you are talking of excavation or loading, it could be cranes, clamshells, drag lines, backhoes, pile drivers, shovels and so on. If you are talking of drilling, it could be percussion drills, rotary drills, the tunnel boring machine. If you are talking of concreting, then you are batching and mixing plant machinery, mixers, transit mixers, pumps, vibrators and so on and so forth. Here is an example of two of the equipment, the backhoe and the direct crane, 
which are used for excavation works manufactured by different people including let us say JCB and there is a cost which is given here as a illustrative number. Of course, in this discussion or this brief discussion that we are having today on equipment management there is no way that we can make a list of all the construction equipment that is used in a construction project and therefore, the simplest thing for me to do is to leave it to you. Please try to make a comprehensive list of equipment and complete the table as suggested. What I am really looking for as far as you are concerned to be able to do this job is to understand the capacity of the equipment and try to look at the costs involved. You will realize that these costs are not trivial. You should also remember that an equipment which is procured is not necessarily consumed at that site. That equipment is not like concrete or it is not like electric wires which are consumed at that site. That is something which is carried over from one site to another and to that extent that equipment becomes an asset for the construction company. So, there is a whole lot of different thought process that goes on when the company tries to procure an equipment or use an equipment for construction at a particular site. And in order to be able to do that exercise, this kind of a list will come in very handy. So, once you do that exercise, you will realize the complexity of the job and also get introduced to the different manufacturers who manufacture different equipment. Now, continuing with the discussion to increase the job site productivity is important to select the equipment with proper characteristics and a size most suitable for work conditions. For example, to excavate earth for a building construction, the following factors could play an important role in selecting the excavator. The size of the job, whether you are trying to do an isolated footing or you are trying to do a raft foundation, the time constraints, soil conditions, availability of the equipment, cost of transportation of equipment, location of dumping areas, climatic conditions and so on. The engineer at site needs to keep all these conditions in mind before deciding which particular excavator will be used for that particular project. Now, let us talk about procurement of equipment. Basically, what we are talking about is the following. We need to use a certain equipment at a certain site. What are our options? The equipment can be purchased Apart from purchase, it could be rented or it could be leased. What is the difference between rented and leased? That is something which we will clarify in a slide or two, but purchase we understand what it means. When is it best to buy an equipment? So, let us try to just cursorily understand what are the conditions which will prompt us to buy an equipment that is the outright purchase of an equipment. Buying is preferred if the equipment is essential for the key operations and is expected to provide service for a long time. So, the contractor makes a decision that well in this project this crane or this excavator is going to be used and it is going to be useful to our company even in the long run in other projects that we are going to do. Owning an equipment can also provide long term tax benefits as we will probably see at some other point in this course. If we decide to buy an equipment, then what are the considerations that should operate on our mind in making the right choice? What is the technology involved? What is the post warranty repair and associated cost? What is the availability of maintenance and repair facility with minimum downtime? What are the operating costs? Is there a proper availability of consumables and spares and what is the ease of installation and operations? So, these are some of the things that must be considered when we are trying to evaluate one equipment versus another from the point of view of purchasing it. So, once we have a list of these items, we can almost compare two equipments A and B in terms of technology, in terms of the post warranty repair and associated costs, the operating costs and so on and so forth and then decide whether we will buy A or we will buy B. 
Now, apart from buying, there is the option of renting an equipment. Acquiring an equipment on rent is preferred when trying an equipment is an option before buying it. If the requirement is limited for a short duration and we do not want to make an investment into buying that equipment. The equipment is required only in certain special projects and if the owned equipment is out of service. So, we are basically saying that we already have the equipment, we do not need another equipment of the same nature, but for some reason the equipment that we have is not working and therefore, as a short term stop gap arrangement, we need to rent an equipment. Now, apart from renting, there is the option of leasing the equipment and leasing an equipment is preferred if the equipment is expected to be used frequently, but sufficient resources are not available to purchase. So, it's because we cannot buy it, we lease it on a long term basis, which is different from renting it, which is for a short term. Now, coming to the third part of our discussion, which is manpower management, the workforce in the construction industry comprises of architects, engineers, which could be from the design office or at site, managers, divisional and sectional managers, human resource team, the tendering team, accounting personnel, drafting personnel, labor, drivers and security staff and the list goes on, welders to carpenters to bar benders, masons, mixer operators, crane operators, depending on the kind of job, if you are doing blasting in quarries, it could be people who are involved in the blasting operations. Now, we must remember that each of these trades has its own qualifications, certifications, licenses. So, a person who is operating a crane has to have a proper license, has to be fit. There are fitness criteria associated with that. A person is operating as a welder, that person needs to have the right kind of certificates. He has to have the right kind of qualifications. So, managing a site involves managing a vast diversity of personnel who are qualified differently and have different responsibilities. So, basically manpower management focuses on estimating the size of the workforce, division into functional teams and scheduling the deployment of manpower during various stages of the project. Much like as in the case of equipments, different kinds of people are required at different stages of the construction work. Civil engineers are required in the beginning when certain kinds of construction is going on. Mechanical engineers are required when the certain erections of equipment and so on is going on. So, for example, civil engineers are required at the outset when we are trying to do the construction activity. If we consider a industrial construction, mechanical and electrical engineers would come in later, welders would come in slightly later when there is erection of pipelines or erection of equipment going on. So, the task of a project manager is to carry out this exercise in a very effective and a optimal manner. Now, with this discussion, let me close by talking about the project manager's role as such. It is a very crucial role and it is expected that he will have a proper balance of technical skills and behavioral skills. And what are the kind of traits or skills that are expected in a project manager could include team building, leadership, conflict resolution, technical expertise, planning, organization, entrepreneurship, administration, management support and resource management. So, only if you have all these skills, you can be a successful project manager at a construction site. So, with this, we come to an end of the first module of this course on construction management, where we talked about largely the project management or construction management in a generic sense. What we will do from now on is to try to get estimates of quantities from drawings, move on to cost and other aspects related to management of construction projects. Thank you.